Hey guys, welcome back to uh, Slime Fun and Survival with Boomer. I uh, just wanted to give you an update here on this base. Uh, we're on a Fnatic MC server, uh, so you're in survival. And uh, we've got the outline of the base in place. This is a 256 block circle that we have slowly started to clear uh, the excess water out of. We're going to drain this out completely and take it all the way down to Y equals 6. Uh, and actually, we're even going to go even further. We're going to go until bedrock stops us. The goal is to remove everything that is not bedrock. Uh, we're going to go all the way down 100% to bedrock. And there's an effect we're going to add later on that we'll talk about uh, later on in the series as we get more and more of this cleared. But today, as I talked about in the last video, we have a different goal in mind. We are going to spend some time talking about the Slime Fun Networks, something that... Uh, you're going to use a lot of whistle and fun to see where I was. And we're going to dig right into this. Um, we're going to talk about, there's uh, one, two, three, four, five different components of networks we're going to talk about today. Uh, let me pull up the slime fun guide here just so we can talk about some of this stuff. So we're going to go into uh, cargo management within a slime fun guide. And what we're going to talk about today be the cargo manager which is kind of like the ups of of uh, slime fun we're going to talk about the connectors the input nodes the output and the advanced output nodes um yeah we'll probably throw the trash can in for a good measure cargo motors we'll talk about that later that more really is a crafting ingredient in in a lot of other recipes but it doesn't play a whole lot into the actual network running so let's start with the cargo manager if you look at this this is a it's a little bit of a, a work to get these things crafted talking about creating holograms if you look at a hologram okay there's an electric motor power crystal which requires synthetic diamond and synthetic uh, emerald and some redstone electric motors as you know we did one of those last episode and some aluminum brass uh, then you're talking about Reinforced plates, each one of those is eight reinforced ingots. Reinforced ingots uh, make are made up from six other ingots. And each one of those has something else that makes it. So they're very labor and time intensive. A couple aluminum bronze, not too bad. And then an Android memory core, which has two power crystals, which means two synthetic diamonds. Uh, and then just some basic other ingredients. So what does a cargo manager do? Well, let's go over to it first of all. The cargo manager literally is exactly that. It manages the cargo on this network and you create your own network. You only need one cargo manager to run a network. If you try to put two on there, you could potentially cause problems. You can run multiple networks on your base as long as they don't interact with each other. In order to keep networks from interacting, if, were, if you want to run two distinct networks for whatever reason, and you, I've got my base has four or five on SkyGrid, um, but you can run multiple cargo networks, you just have to keep them from interacting. So as you'll see, we currently have the visualizer turned on. If you right click, you'll see in the bottom left corner of my screen, cargo net visualizer, it's X dot meaning it's off. Right click on it again and it comes up, which tells you how far its reach is. So if I go to the right, one, two, three, four, five, six, any other cargo connector node or any other input or output node that this can reach, that those red dots touch, will overlap the two networks. In other words, if I were to stick a cargo manager right here, those two networks would actually be one and they would cause problems. They would interfere with each other. If I put a cargo manager one block over to the right, while the signals from the two would overlap, they would not talk to each other, and it would be two separate networks. Now here's where the problem comes in. If I were to place a connector node in between the two, I would inadvertently connect the two networks. If I were to place a chest right there and have an input or an output node on that block, on that chest, that chest could be affected and would be affected by both networks. So you have to be careful how you lay them out so they're not too close and that they're not overlapping. Now, I found ways to move things from one network to another, and you simply have to make sure that on one network you use a channel that's not used on the other network. That way, you don't risk accidentally moving stuff the wrong direction. 
So they have a range of uh, six blocks, one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? They do not need to be powered. They will run without power on the network. Uh, and that's pretty much it. So they can shoot up vertically or to the X and or the Z axis. However, if I were to place a connector node right here onto, uh, what do we got here, onto this furnace, it would not work. Because the connector node is not in a direct line, I'm sorry, the, the input or output node, if I put one on this furnace, would not be in a direct line with the cargo network or the cargo connectors. They have to be in a direct vertical or horizontal line. It does not work on diagonals. So you got to keep that in mind when you lay out your network. Most blocks on the network will require an input and an output node. Now some will be simply an output node, meaning you're putting a final product into a chest. Some will be just an input where you're pulling resources into, say, a smeltery to make an ingredient. So what is the difference between a cargo manager and the connector node? The connecting node simply extends the network six blocks past it. So in this case, we have a cargo manager that connects to this node. And here's how you tell if the node is connected. If you right click it, it will say connected and give you a green check mark. If it's not connected, it'll say not connected, give you a red X. So we know that this is connected. Now it will go six more blocks from here. So if you want to extend a network, that connecting node must be placed within the six dust that you, the red signal on the screen. So I would place a connector node right here and I could connect it another six blocks down. If I were to place a connection node right here, it would not interact with the network. Now we have input and output nodes. And this is what confused me a little bit when I first started. To me, an input means I'm going to input something into a chest. And it's actually the exact opposite. You're going to input, input, to me, input something from a chest into the network. Remember, you got to look at it. This is a network item, so you have to look at it from the perspective of what does it do for the network. And it pulls things into the network. So let's open up one here so you can see what the GUI looks like. You have a few different things within this network node. All right. If this is the uh, items down here, these nine blocks, you can have up to nine different items pulled into one network node, which makes it pretty nice when you're talking about working with a dust washer because it produces nine different types of dust. So it's obviously that was kind of probably planned. I can use one input node, nine different dust can come in. Or if I'm sorting out, um, if I'm on Skyblock, for example, with a cobblestone generator that generates ores, I could sort out nine different things on that generator and have them go to different sorting systems. All right. The, you have two types of nodes that you can configure. You can configure it for a whitelist, meaning only allow in what I put in these three square sets of squares, the nine by nine, three by three here, these nine squares. Right now I'm in whitelist mode. This means only currently cobblestone can get pulled out of the chest. Doesn't matter what else is in there, it will only pull cobble. If I were to change this to blacklist, it will pull everything but cobblestone. If I want to pull just everything, I would take the cobble out and switch it to blacklist. And that will pull everything out of the chest. If I want to pull nothing out of the chest, I leave it like it is right now. So I can set the network up and then when I'm ready to pull a cobble out because I have to do things further down the network and I don't want to get anything screwed up until I'm done, I leave everything out of there when I'm ready. I pull out the cobble and that's going to send it out. Including sub IDs and durability. In other words, you can click to say, does this have to match Yes or no. So for example, if you're at a wither skeleton farm, they drop stones of varying levels of remaining durability, anywhere from one to, I think a stone sword is 32 and I may be wrong and, and that's not the point. I could say, I only want the stone swords that are left with 14 out of 32. I can put that in there and if I find a stone sword, stone sword with 13 left, it won't pull it in. If it has 14, it will. Include lore, so I can make sure if the lore matches or not, 
and you'll have to uh, forgive me. I honestly have not looked into the lore yet. I haven't had a need to look into the lore yet. So someone might know what this is. And if you do leave comments below, I honestly have not tried to look into this yet. I have not found an applicable situation where I need it yet. Um, so no big deal. Uh, round Robin. Why would you use Round Robin? Well, let's explain what Round Robin is. If I'm using multiple gold pans, let's say I have five ore crushers, I'm sorry, ore grinders, and I have five gold pans. Out of the ore crusher or grinder will come gravel from cobblestone. Going from the ore grinder to the gold pan, that gravel has to be distributed into the gold pans. If I have round robin off as I currently do right now, it will go to the first available spot it finds in the network and fill it up. It is possible that that first machine can be so efficient that it can actually keep up on its own. And the other four never get the distribution of the other. And it's slowing the farm down because it will always go to the first available slot. So if there's 128 slots available, that will take 120 items before the second one even kicks in. But if I have round robin on, it will equally distribute, or really close to equally at least, it'll be much closer to dead even. Uh, those 120 items instead would go to roughly 25 or 26 in each one. It might be 23 and 28, but it'd be really close. The more items or more machines you have, obviously the more likely that balance won't be perfect. If I have 20 machines running, or like for example on SkyGrid, I have 72 ore grinders running all in Ron Robin mode, going into 38 gold pans. They're going to be a little off. They're not going to be perfectly balanced, but they are pretty consistently close. Okay. So Ron Robin simply distributes the items evenly. So if you're only going from one ore grinder to one gold pan, Ron Robin won't do you any good because there's only one item on that network to go to. If you're going to two or more and you want it as evenly balanced as it'll go to, use a Ron Robin. If you say, send it all to my primary chest that I'm going to use and let the overflow go to the secondary, then turn off Ron Robin as long as the primary is physically closer on the network. Okay. In addition, you have uh, 17 different channels that you can use. Channels 1 through 16 are designed to be used and only pull resources to and from where you are at the final destination or moving items to. Channel 17 has the access of a CT network. So I'm going to go back to channel 17. So this lowers the channel by one. This increases the channel by one. Channel 17 can have a chest terminal channel hooked up to it. Now, I have not crafted one of these here on Survival. I simply haven't had the resources or the time to show you how this works. Uh, later on down the road, as we get more materials and stuff, we'll set one of these up and we'll talk about it and exactly how it does. The goal is to help you understand the input nodes and how this works. So I can, for example, let's say I have a network spread out over about 70 blocks. And I'm at a farm where I need to get bone meal. Instead of running those 70 blocks, I can have a chest terminal hooked up to the network on channel 17 at where the bones are and pull them remotely. And as long as they're on channel 17, anything set to 17, I can pull to where I physically happen to be. I'll actually be able to access the items with that inventory. Okay. So it saves me from having to run back. It's kind of almost like having a, another, uh, like a portable ender chest that you still can see right off the bat. So it gives you uh, an ability to get items to you a little bit faster on the network versus having to go and try them. Now you could say, yeah, you could just set up a node to send that there by extending the network down and, and you could. Or you can access it remotely because you can change and or add multiple items on channel 17. Something you can, you know, sometimes the space just doesn't allow you to put everything there. So it's a nice benefit. All right. Now let's talk about output nodes. And there are two types. There's a traditional output node, output. And what that one will do is anything on that channel, anything and everything without exception, will go into the storage facility or item you designate. 
the advanced output node will allow you to configure only certain items to go into that output. And that's where it gets to be nice. For example, it works as an item sorter. Instead of using the traditional Impulse SV Redstone sorter, you can have the network do it for you. So this is a standard output node. You'll see I can simply move the channel up and down. So I can decrease it by one. I can increase it by one. Currently, this is on channel four. No particular reason. It just is. An advanced one, and I don't think I have one set up yet. Oh, here we do. Okay, we have an advanced output node for a reason. I wanted just the sifted R. Let's go over this. Let's talk about this. All right, so from the gold pan, when it's running, it's not running right now. The gold pan, when it has gravel, produces these four items. Clay balls, sifted ore, flint, and iron nuggets. I currently have the clay and the flint, and I think at the moment the iron nuggets too, because I haven't set up a press. Um, three out of the four of these go right into the trash can. But the sifted ore is what goes to the gold pan to create the different dusts that are available. So you'll see it comes out on, I'm sorry, comes out over here on the input node on channel three. But all I have coming in is just the sifted ore. I have the remaining items going into this trash can. Clay, flint, and iron nuggets. So you can send, again, it's a sorting system. Items can go anywhere on the network you want. Another thing you could do, like I said, the iron nuggets will go into a press to be made back into iron ingots. The clay could go right to a furnace to become bricks to make brick blocks. And flint can be recycled in a press to make cobblestone. So if you need additional cobblestone, it's a way to take the material and resources you're already generating and get those back into the system. So when the gravel comes, I'm sorry, the sifted ore comes in, it can produce nine different um, gold dust, excuse me, nine different dust. And I actually, I have those right here. Now I took the system offline, I took them all out of there because I wasn't running it and I just wanted to, for some silly reason, put them on here, I don't know why. Oh, I remember why. Uh, but it doesn't even matter. So for the moment, I'm using one chest to store this up. Eventually, we're going to use the barrels. We're going to get we're going to get gutsy. We're going to try the barrels on survival. Um, the slime flint plugin we've talked about this a lot on this and the other series has been riddled historically with some issues. Now I seem to be the exception. I've had almost no issues with the barrels. Uh, others have, and we can't pin down why. We believe there was a recent update to the slime flint, which may have stopped some of the problems um so we're going to get gutsy we're going to go ahead and test them because i know how to run them so what i see here you know this isn't a whole lot of materials and resources if we're going to develop everything that we need to on here we need a whole lot more than this we need double double chests of i mean multiple of aluminum of copper of gold of iron of silver of tin of lead magnesium yeah kind of useless um and silver, not as much, although there are a few recipes. Uh, we won't use a whole lot of silver. Uh, and we're going to ta tailor those barrels that we're going to use to the item that we need. So we're not storing a million magnesium dust when no one needs it. Uh, and so those are the five uh, main items that are part of the network that you would use on a regular basis. So is there a limit to how many items you can use on a network? I currently have not found one. For example, on SkyGrid, I have a system set up where on one channel, 96 items can be identified and pulled out of a single chest. Now, having said that, it only pulls one item at a time, meaning the first item that comes up gets detected, goes to its proper channel. So it is only pulling one stack at a time. Um, so it's not like I have, you know, six or seven or eight of those things running at once. For example, if I put in 16 different colors of wool, it will pull one color of wool at a time. So it doesn't overload the network. Um, but to the other extent, I have 72 ore grinders turning cobble into gravel, all in the same channel, 
all Ron robbing, Ron robbing to the next machine. Now, if anybody goes to my Sky Gear base, they know, they know the TPS. I'm sorry, not the TPS. Your frames per second drops on my base. When everything is running, it can probably drop in half. Um, when I'm out in the wild, I get anywhere from 80 to 100, 110. Mine drops probably down to 20 to 30 when everything is running. Um, so it does affect FPS a little bit, actually a lot. Now, I'm just running a, a, a ThinkPad, nothing, you know, tremendous. Um, and I don't have a super GTX graphics card, trust me. I'm running Microsoft's basic graphics here. So obviously, you know, those that have some better and more improved graphics card will have better results. But the more systems you run, the more advanced you make your networks, there is some drag down on your FPS. So just be prepared. If you really go bonkers like me, your performance, and you may have seen it on some of my videos, it does go down a little bit because of that. So I'm trying to be conscious and aware of that. So one of the things I always do is I turn off the cargo net visualizer. Doesn't give me a whole lot back, maybe one or two. The other thing I just found out today, I had my chunk rendering distance set to 28. So when I turn it back down to 12, my FPS shoots up like crazy. So I'll, I'll swap that back over. Um, but that's pretty much it. The basics of the network of what you need to know uh, to craft these things. Yes, uh, the cargo manager is expensive to craft, as is the advanced output node. The other two output nodes and the connectors aren't too bad. Um, they don't take as much. So once you get going, like I said, you know, I, I got this going simply to get some dust going. So I didn't have to sit there and beat this thing. So while I am clearing water, I have this running. And, and what I'm going to be doing is setting up to, uh, I took it off for the moment, uh, but I'm going to reset up so that coal is going right to the generator. That way I don't have to reload it every time it runs out. So these can keep going so I can continue to get more dust because the next thing I need to start working on is setting up smelteries, automatic running smelteries to start getting the ingots I need, start crafting more machines and I can let that run while I'm clearing out water. So that's pretty much it. I'm gonna wrap things up right here. Um, I really do, God, I gotta quit saying um, I'm saying it way too often. But I do wanna thank you guys for watching. Uh, if there's anything in particular that I cover along the way that you need me to go on a further clarification, please do. I'm not going to initially spend much time getting into detailed builds. Right now, this beginning of the series is meant to help you understand the basic principles of Slime Farm, the machines, the functions of them. Everything, like I've said, I've hammered this home. This guide, see this guide? Yeah. Everything that you see in there. Yeah, right there, baby. You need to know is in that guide. If we take the time to read and understand what it says and do, probably 95% of it can be figured out simply by reading the guide. There's a few things that they've included videos for to help you along the way, which I thought were great because not everything is as simple. Um, but we're going to do everything we can to focus solely on the guide to try to understand how this works. Now, there are some things you're going to have to figure out on your own. And I'm including some of those things in here. But what fun is it if I give you every single possible answer? I just don't work that way. Because I want you to enjoy, if you are playing Slime Fun, whether on the Fnatic MC server or on another server, or you've even downloaded it for a single player world, I want you to enjoy it and get something out of the learning process. This is a concept, in my opinion, that unfortunately society has gotten away from. We want instant gratification. We want it now. We don't care how we get it. And we really don't want to spend any time getting that knowledge and learning things. Our society has been very prevalently running that way for a number of years now. And it's a shame because so much is lost in the journey to learn. And I'm not talking about school. I'm talking about just simply exploring and understanding. And that's what I think made so many great people that we hold up in society as great inventors, great mathematicians, great leaders, is the fact that they were willing to learn and make mistakes. And I'm going to tell you, I don't care if you've heard it a thousand times or if you've never heard it, 
You will learn so much more from your mistakes and your failures than you ever will from all of your successes. I wish you the best of luck, guys. Thanks for watching. Next time, uh, we'll be back on Survival with a couple of new features. Um, and I just always want to tell you, you got to go boomer. You got to go home if you don't. So we'll see you later.